Hello chaps and chapesses, and today we're going to talk about top tips for mayfly fishing. The mayfly hatch or ephemera danica hatch, sometimes ephemera vulgata or even lineata. But the mayfly hatch that we call it over here in the UK is one thing that all fly fishermen absolutely dream about. It's truly magical, it's very special, and it's one of those things that we look forward to every year. You know, we're all sitting there waiting. Is it going to start on this date or is it going to start on that date? Who's seen the first duns appearing on the river and up and down the river banks it goes? So it gets us all into this very, very excited state. For me, the mayfly is somewhat a phenomenon. It conjures up images of large fluttering insects moving around the meadows. Um, I'm looking for spinners, I'm looking for duns, I'm looking for the nymphs and it's everything that goes with it and it just gets me incredibly excited. So we are in the throes of the mayfly at the moment. It's a little later this year than normal, but last night and the night before we had extraordinary spinner falls on the Anton and last week down on the test and it's continuing to do that now. So we thought we'd cover a few little tips and tricks that we've learned while being on the river during the mayfly hatch. Often called duffer's fortnight because the fish seem to lose all sense of control and throw caution to the wind and it's often a time where even a muppet like me can catch a fish. So I'm going to run through some little tips and tricks which we've put together which hopefully will make you more successful during this time. It can be a time of utter plenty but can also be incredibly frustrating. So the first tip that I want to talk about is leaders. Leader materials, what should you use? How long should it be? Normally I'm fishing with something like a 12 foot plus tapered leader, uh, tapered down to about 6x, about 3.5 pounds breaking strain, and on that I might put a couple of extra feet of tippet just to give me a little bit more distance between the end of my fly line and the fish. Now when you start trying to put these things, which are about the size of a small chicken on the end, you start putting that on six sets taper and you will find yourself in a terrible mess in a very short space of time. They spin. Oh my word, do they spin. So if you're making any form of cast trying to get under a bush, you'll suddenly find that the whole of the end of your tippet material has been screwed into a tiny little ball and you're wondering where the line gremlins came from and how on earth did that happen? Well, the best way to combat that and what most of us do during mayfly time is we go into thicker nylon. We go into thicker, co mostly copolymers. I don't generally use fluorocarbon during this time because it does tend to sink a little bit. And as you move into a recast, quite often it'll suck the fly underneath the water and saturate it, which is not ideal when you're trying to keep these big flies buoyant. I do like to go for as long a leader as you are capable of handling and that should go down to about a 5x point, something like four and a half pounds breaking strain. Why should you use a longer leader? It's exactly the same as fishing at any time of the year. Just because the fish are going bananas and smashing everything that moves doesn't mean they've suddenly become totally stupid. And actually, a longer leader will keep you further away from the fish. And make sure you take the time to degrease these leaders especially when you are fishing in very bright sunny conditions like we had the other day, you must degrease at least the first two or three feet, something with fuller's earth or mud or some such thing, just takes the shine off that line and makes it less visible to the fish. The next thing I want to mention is be patient. So many times, it's so exciting, we rush down to the river and we start thrashing away madly. And I know this is something I tend to say all the time. It's absolutely crucial that you get down, walk down to the bottom of the beat, don't walk down the bank because otherwise the fish are all going to see you. Try and use a return path or go into the field and then cut across further down and sit on a bench and just wait. Just observe. 
you must take the time. And with mayfly fishing, that's important because you want to see what stage the insects are hatching and what stage the trout are going to be feeding on. I'm not going to go into the whole life cycle of the ephemera species because I think there are people who will do it far more elegantly than I, but I will just mention a few of the stages while we're trying to move through a far more practical process. So to begin with, the fish are going to be feeding on the nymphal stage. And these obviously having been in the river system for 18 months to two years, and they're crawling up the edges of the reeds and that's when they begin to hatch. And you'll start seeing the shucks coming down the river. The shucks are the empty cases. The trout absolutely love the nymphal stage. Problem is, on most of our southern chalk streams, we can't use nymphs. It's upstream dry fly only. So what do you do in that situation? The fish are feeding on nymphs, you can see them darting around, they're moving this way and that and smashing the nymphs. So you've got to get a little bit inventive and in these situations quite often fishing terrestrials is enough to actually make them come up onto the surface. If it's very very bright then try and find some shaded areas, they'll probably be hung up against the edge of bushes and trees. But terrestrial patterns such as uh, foam beetles, maybe some hawthorn patterns, the dreadful, horrible, hairy daddy long legs is always a very popular one. And those attractor patterns will sometimes pull those fish out of their nymphal frenzy and make them look up. And that's what we're really trying to achieve. So that normally happens in the first stage of the morning. You know, if you're lucky, then you might see a few duns beginning to pop off at about 10, 30, 11 ish. And then that will build during the course of the day. But be patient, see what stage they're feeding at. Don't just rush in with a massive mayfly pattern and start flogging away because you may be disappointed. So on dry fly water, what I quite often like to start with is an emerger pattern. So there's a number of different ones. My favorite is Jardine's emerger, which has got a little foam head on it, which means that it sits very nicely in the water surface and doesn't sink. I like foam patterns because they don't sink, makes life a bit easier and stops me going through vast quantities of floatant. Sometimes the fish get clued into the emergers quite quickly and actually that can be really deadly and quite often you'll find that that will be a really good midday pattern. And then the duns begin to appear. So the duns or sub imago phase of the mayfly is that big sailboat type classical mayfly pattern that you see sailing down the river. And you know, recently we've been having those popping off first thing in the morning but they don't really build into a crescendo until probably after lunch. And it does depend massively on the temperature. So if you've got a really bright day, it's very likely that mayfly hatch is going to happen, but it may not happen until much later when the sun comes off the water. So please bear that in mind. It's really important. And so many people go home just when it's about to start. Don't do that. Stay. Stay until later, because that's when it gets really good. So once the duns do start coming off, quite a few of the fish will start to clue into those and think, hmm, lunch. At that point, it's a really good idea to find a decent size dun pattern. I quite like the Mohican mayfly again, because it has a foam tail and it doesn't sink, which is a really good one. And I like that pattern a lot. And try and land that done reasonably close to the fish's head. It gives it less time to think about it. If it sees it sailing down, it might decide to eat something else. But generally speaking, when they begin to switch onto those, casting reasonably close to them is quite a good idea. If you have a fish which is perhaps playing a little bit hard to get, sometimes a little bit of a wiggle can actually make that fly flutter a little bit and make it look a little bit irresistible. A little bit of an inducement there to try and get that fish to come up and hit it. Mayfly, thank heavens, keep gentlemanly hours. How very convenient of them. So actually, what you want to be doing as the morning progresses is starting to look up in the willow trees and the trees around the riverbank and you want to see if there's any spinners beginning to come out. So the spinners are the next stage, the second stage if you like, and that's where these duns will split their cases and emerge as a full adult and begin their mating ritual. And what you'll see is you'll see them start to dance up and down by the trees. And this is just a massive indicator. You want to watch those begin to build in numbers 
And you may find that actually it just goes very quiet for a bit if the weather conditions are not right. And then you, if you look underneath the leaves or underneath the branches of the trees, you may find them lined all the way there, just waiting. So once we hit that really exciting period where things are really beginning to kick off, you'll quite often see the spinners and the, the males will be grabbing the females to mate, and then you'll see them all dancing back to the river. Now this is where things are gonna start hotting up. This is normally the time that you wanna be there for the action. The action. The number of those adults will begin to build on the water and start sailing down. And that's when you have to start thinking about sequences. And I know that people talk about this, but it is actually really true. Quite often, these trout will become so choosy that they are waiting for every fourth fly or every fifth fly. Why? Have you ever tried to eat five Big Macs in a row? Yeah, you need to just take a bit of a chill and let that lot go down before you then smash it up with a bit of a McFlurry afterwards. So if you found a particular fish that you really want to try and catch that one, then actually you have to figure out which sequence of fly you have to place your artificial. And I know that sounds absolutely mad, but actually, it really works. Quite often you'll see them take three and then they'll go quiet. And then they'll come up again and then they'll take three more. So just bear that in mind, observe the fish that you're trying to stalk. Once you see the spinners begin to move to the water and the females also dancing on the water, this is the time that you need to slightly change tactics. So rather than fish those big Mohican mayflies, you need to start fishing the spent gnat type flies. So those are the ones which have got the spread wings and look a bit pathetic. Those will be the females mostly, which are at that point laying their eggs and the activity of laying the eggs is so exhausting that it pretty much kills them off. So then they're just left with their wings fluttering in the surface and this is absolutely irresistible, absolutely irresistible to these fish and this is where things really begin to hot up. So make sure you do make that switch to some kind of spent gnat pattern, something with a splayed wing, you want some of those in your armory and if you want a really good one that's great for this kind of thing, the French partridge is a classic pattern. I know it doesn't look much, but it is extremely effective. The next piece of advice I would really like to, uh, to give you is try not to get flustered. When this thing really does kick off and you've got fish rising around all over the river, it can be very easy to just sort of go into a complete tailspin and you're madly frantically casting at this fish and then frantically casting at that fish and then this one again and that one over there and you don't know which one that you should actually be trying to target. Slow down. Find a particular target and work that particular fish and you will find that is going to be a far more successful method. As that hatch builds to crescendo, uh, the last couple of nights it's been around sort of 7 p.m. It's been really interesting to see how selective the fish can become. And this is where the frustration element can come in. So where you've caught fish quite happily for the last hour and a half, suddenly they're really hard. And this is because they can become far more discerning in their choice of food. And also they're probably quite full. So it's less like, hmm, the wafer thin mint. Yeah, it's that scenario. So you've got to change your approach a little bit, be a little bit more cunning, maybe lengthen out your leader, and then that French partridge is brilliant at this time. It just sits there, sort of soggy in the surface film, and it looks just like a complete spent spinner after it's done its hardest, and it's done its thing, and it's now done in. If you've got a fish which is being really selective, then you may need to cycle through several different patterns of mayfly. So in your box, make sure that you've got more than just one mayfly pattern that you really like the look of in the shop. So make sure that you've got maybe three or four because that can be the key to success or failure. The other approach is maybe it's the right fly and the wrong fish. And I know that sounds almost completely contradictory to what I just said, but quite often that can also be the case. I love it when two things can be true. So if you don't want to be cycling through patterns, just move straight on to the next rising fish. And it's, you will find almost certainly that one will probably hit that fly. For me, it was a bit like asking girls in a dance hall whether they would like to dance with me. Some of you who are watching this may be thinking, what on earth is he on about? What is this mayfly hatch? he speak of. 
It is something truly magnificent. It is one of nature's great wonders. And to be on the river and in the meadows in the evening when this is going on and behold it and be part of it is something truly special. So if you have not tried it, I would really urge you as a fly fisherman that this should be something on your bucket list. Well, as always, I hope you found that video of use. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and I'll look forward to seeing you on the next one.